Hello. This is Norman Dacey. Let's talk for a few minutes about you and your estate. Thomas Collins, whose fine column, The Golden Years, is nationally syndicated in newspapers throughout the country, recently reprinted a letter which he'd received from a reader. Here are a few paragraphs from that letter, which Mr. Collins prefaced with the admonition that husbands may want to make a note of this. It was just seven months after his retirement that my husband had died. It was sudden. There was no time for any final advice to me. The 17 months that have passed since have been a shocking and frightful experience. I'm not speaking of the sorrow and the awful aloneness. These are very private matters one must face as one can. I'm speaking of money. I have never worked and had never taken more than a passive road in our financial affairs. My husband managed well, and when he died, he left behind a will drawn by his lawyer that gave to me all that we had. Or so one would have thought. So he thought. But in the 17 months since the funeral, I still have not been able to get his estate out of the probate court. I haven't been able to get any money from the estate, except for a few small sums that were given to me after I had made pleas of virtual poverty to my husband's lawyer. My husband set up our affairs on the basis of what should have been good professional advice. There was enough money for me to live in some dignity after he died. He would die a second time if he knew the frustrations and beggings I've gone through in these 17 months. And how much of what he left will be going to lawyer fees, court costs, and taxes before I get it. There's something shameful about it all. Now, it would be difficult to trace the writer of that letter because, you see, it could have been written by any one of several million American widows who have been the victims of an ugly conspiracy called probate. Let's begin by establishing just what this probate is. In every legal jurisdiction in America, there is a special court which concerns itself with the administration of estates. In some areas, it's called the Orphan's Court. In others, the Chancery Court. In still others, the Surrogate Court. But its most common name is Probate Court. When you die, one of your relatives will carry your will into that court and ask that it be accepted for probate. The probate judge will examine it to determine that it was drawn with due regard for the legal requirements and that all of the legal niceties were observed in its execution and will accept it for probate and direct the executor whom you've appointed to proceed with the distribution of your estate in accordance with your instructions. If you have died intestate, that is, having left no will, the judge will appoint an administrator whose job it will be to distribute your estate in accordance with the laws of the state in which you live. In other words, if you don't make a will, the state will write one for you and probate it. Incidentally, that distribution may be quite different from the one which you would have made, for example, in many states, the law provides, in the case of a childless couple, that upon the death of the husband, without having made a will, the widow will receive the first $5,000 of his estate. The balance of his estate she splits equally with his parents. The probate court also appoints guardians for the estates of minors and conservators for the estates of incompetence. It has a few other peripheral duties, but in general, this is what the probate court is and what it does. It came into being many generations ago as a device to protect heirs. Alas, that which was created to protect them has now become their greatest enemy. Throughout America, the probate system has degenerated into what can only be described as a racket a particularly vicious racket because it preys chiefly upon widows and orphans or other dependents who sorely need every dollar available to them. There are three things wrong with probate. First, it costs too much. Second, it takes too long. Finally, there's too much publicity attached to it. 
The principal reason that it costs too much is that in most areas, everyone or nearly everyone connected with probate works on commission. That is, they receive a percentage of the estate. The system victimizes both the rich and the poor, but particularly the poor. We have in this country a graduated system of taxes. So far as our incomes or our estates are concerned, the bigger the income or the estate, the higher the tax rate assessed against it. While some may say that this is a soak the rich idea, at least the heaviest burden of taxation falls upon those best able to bear it. In the probate area, too, we have a graduated tax. But curiously, it is graduated the other way. The burden falls heaviest upon those who can least afford it. The rich get soaked, but actually it is those in modest circumstances who get soaked the hardest. If a man dies leaving $10 million and loses a million of it to the probate racketeers, at least he has left his family enough to get along on. But when a man dies leaving, say, $25,000, and 5000 is siphoned off by the iniquitous probate system, those dollars were taken from beneficiaries who badly needed every one of them. Mind you now, we're not speaking here of taxes, properly levied upon our estates by our legally constituted state or federal government. We are talking about a private tax imposed upon us by the legal establishment under an antiquated, unnecessary, and morally unjustifiable system, which it insists is for our protection, but which is in fact simply for its own enrichment. Franklin D. Roosevelt died, leaving an estate of $1,940,000. The probate system took 11% of it. Dixie Lee Crosby, the wife of Bing Crosby, died leaving $1,332,000. The probate system took 8.5% of all that she left. Gertrude Strong Achilles, whose family backed George Eastman, died in California leaving $10,883,000. The probate system took 11% of it. Robert Sterling Clark, the heir to the Singer sewing machine fortune, died in New York. The administration expense was $856,000. The executor received $2,965,000. And the lawyer? Well, he demanded and received $1,000,000. There was $4,325,000 in cash in the estate. It all went for fees, and another third of a million dollars with it. Now, before you go shrugging all this off as something that happens to wealthy people but can't happen to you, just remember what I said a moment ago, that percentage-wise the burden of the probate racket falls heaviest on people of modest means. Right here on my desk is the front page of a newspaper. A headline reads, Fees eat up nearly half of an estate of $19,425. The attorney whom the probate court appointed as administrator took $4,427, or 23% of the $19,425 estate. The lawyer whom the administrator hired to guide him took $3,677, or 19% of the $19,425 estate. He died before he finished the job, and they paid a third lawyer $750 just to tidy up. Between them, the three lawyers stripped the estate of 40% of its value, and all this looting was approved without hesitation by the local probate court. Here's another clipping from a Cincinnati paper, an editorial highly critical of the local probate court. It points out that from an estate of $38,000, there was $12,000 left for the heirs after fees, expenses, and legal services were paid. According to the schedule of fees set up by the local bar association, the attorney should have received $1,347. He was paid $8,625. A certain Will Jackson was an appraiser for the estate. 
Mr. Jackson was an appraiser on a score of other estates in the recent past, on more than 50 estates over the past several years. Actually, there isn't any Will Jackson. He was just a straw man created by a probate court aide who took the money thus stolen from widows and orphans. Or take the case of a woman who died leaving $25,000 in the bank. The probate court, in its usual fashion, appointed a local lawyer as administrator. He hired himself as attorney for the estate and collected both fees. According to the state statute and the Bar Association schedule, the administrator's fee should have been $626 and the attorney's fee $959, a total of $1,585. Actually, he drew down $7,500, five times what he should have received, and the probate judge approved it. He even charged the estate for a trip abroad, supposedly to search for the decedent's heirs, but he reported to the court that he could find none. So the estate, or what was left of it, went to the state by default. Recently, a newspaper set two of its reporters looking into the case. They located the heirs in three days, simply by walking into the local library. The attorney had collected $7,000 for not finding them. Recently, Senator Robert F. Kennedy observed that the probate court is shot through with scandal, scandal which has been documented over the years, and he cited the case of a lawyer who had received a $1,000 fee for probating a $1,400 estate. Senator Kennedy branded the probate court as a political toll booth, exacting tribute from widows and orphans. Professor William Fratcher of the University of Missouri Law School said recently, we know that it's easier to take money from heirs before they get it, and that the probate court lends itself to certain rackets that have to be eliminated. Professor William J. Pierce of the University of Michigan Law School has decried the corrupt practices in the probate system, saying, the vast majority of lawyers and judges in the United States recognize the need for basic reform in our probate court, but few lawyers and fewer judges are willing or have the courage to speak out. That means that it's going to be up to the public to make the start. The way to begin is for each community to take a good long look at what goes on in the local probate court. Sooner or later, some of your own family's money will be involved. It's time we found out just what part of the billions going through those courts sticks to the fingers of politicians and court appointees. Then we must find a way to put an end to this legal extortion. So spoke Professor Pierce. The probate court provides endless political patronage in the form of appointments as appraiser of estates or as special guardian of children or incompetence. The appraisers do nothing to earn their fees. They simply sign their name and are then handed a chunk of the decedent's estate. This is the payoff for helping the probate judge get elected or for otherwise working on behalf of the political party in power. The political boss of your town may call the probate judge and say, you remember old Joe Green over in the 5th District? Joe's had a lot of hard luck lately. He needs a little help. Give him an appraisership. And so old Joe Green is appointed as one of the appraisers of your estate. The attorney who is handling the probating of the estate, and the law has surrounded the process with so much legal mumbo-jumbo that you have to hire a lawyer to guide you through the maze they've created. The attorney will call a friend of his in the brokerage business and obtain the prices of the stocks you owned as of the date of your death. Then he'll call a friend who's in the real estate business and ask him to drive by your house and give him an idea of what it's worth. These valuations will be listed on an official appraisal sheet, and the two old Joe Greens, sometimes there are three of them, will be called in and directed to sign their names at the bottom of the sheet, after which each will be given a piece of your estate. He will have done nothing. He performed no service at all and yet he will receive a percentage of your estate. In some states, there are official state appraisers. In one such state, 
The state appraisers were found to have looted safe deposit boxes of more than $40,000 over a five-month period. In another state, a panel of political favorites serve as appraisers. Some of them earn from $40,000 to $60,000 per year, which compares pretty favorably with what the governor of the state earns. At least he works for it. The appraisal system everywhere is simply a legalized racket, a description actually applied to it by the former president of the Connecticut Bar Association. One of the most vicious aspects of probate involves the appointment of special guardians. Recently, national publicity was given to the appointment of a former mayor of a large city as special guardian of 11 children who were the beneficiaries of a trust fund established in a New York bank many years ago by their grandfather. The children all live at great distances from the city. Their mothers protested to the court the appointment of a total stranger as guardian of their children. It was of no avail. The court confirmed the appointment of the politician as guardian. A knowledgeable probate attorney called it a nice going away present for the mayor and estimated that his fees would run to $50,000 for doing absolutely nothing. In New York, there are two probate judges. One of them recently appointed the 30-year-old lawyer son of the other judge as special guardian of 35 infants who were beneficiaries of a $5 million trust. When newspaper men sensing an impropriety questioned him about the appointment, the judge reported that he had done it as a wedding present for the young man. Now, I think that probate judges are as entitled as any of the rest of us to give wedding presents. I think, though, that they are entitled to pay for them out of their own pockets, just as we do, and not charge them to the widows and orphans who are the beneficiaries of estates which have had the misfortune to come into their courts to be protected. Recently, a man reported to me that his two children had inherited $1,000 each in the will of their maternal grandmother. The probate judge refused to allow the executor to pay the money to the children's parents and instead insisted upon appointing two local attorneys as special guardians of the children. The executor sent each attorney a check for $1,000. Each deducted a fee of $250 for his services and sent the $750 balance on to the children's parents. Neither attorney performed any useful service. Each cut himself in for one quarter of the bequest. This was just political patronage. No wonder that New York's famous reform mayor, Fiorello LaGuardia, called the probate court the most expensive undertaking establishment in the world. Time magazine has called it one of U.S. law's darkest scandals. Newsweek magazine reported that the probate courts merely prolong the pain with months or years of delays in which judges' cronies line up for money-gobbling jobs as administrators, executors, and trustees. The Wall Street Journal noted that attempts to reform probate courts rarely succeed because few lawyers want to disturb the gravy train dispensing them such huge favors. Not long ago, a Wisconsin businessman found himself called upon to serve as executor of his mother's $172,000 estate. He invited his company's regular attorney to handle the matter for him on the same hourly rate basis which he regularly charged to handle the company's legal affairs. The lawyer explained that he couldn't do it that way. The Bar Association had established a minimum fee schedule, he pointed out, and according to that schedule, he had to charge the executor $4,800 for preparing the forms needed to probate the estate. Since the estate was a simple one, the businessman concluded that the bar's fee was much too high for the services to be performed, so he sat down and made out the forms himself and took them to the probate court. The probate judge refused to accept them on the grounds that they had not been prepared by an attorney. The businessman took his case to a higher court, but in the face of the vigorous opposition of the organized bar, he lost it. 
The result? He had to pay $4,800 ransom to get his mother's estate out of probate. A number of businesses in this country have felt the stern hand of the government cracking down on them for engaging in price-fixing conspiracies. Nothing is said, however, about the shocking price-fixing conspiracy which marks the determination by the bar associations of the exact amount of tribute which the widows and orphans of the country must pay to lawyers to obtain that which is rightfully theirs. And these people talk so sanctimoniously about their canons of ethics. It's enough to make honest people sick all over the carpet. And then there's the delay. On average, it takes two to five years to probate an estate. Recently, I read in the paper of a woman who had applied to the county welfare board for aid because she was down to her last 35 cents. Five years ago, her father died and left her $546,000. She hadn't been able to lay her hands on a penny of it, and it looked as if it would be another five years before she got anything. Here was a woman who had inherited more than a half million dollars, but who was reduced to asking for public charity by the workings of this scandalous probate system. Recently, a man wrote me from San Francisco that his grandfather's estate had set some kind of a record there. It had been in probate in that city for 28 years. Finally, there's the publicity of probate which attracts to heirs the attention of unscrupulous persons who prey upon beneficiaries and frequently separate them from their legacies. Well, we've covered the probate system pretty well here. I guess that you now know why it should be avoided at all costs. And it can be avoided, you know. As the Colorado Bar Journal said, this drain on an estate is tolerated by the general public only because it has been led to believe that such costs are normal and unavoidable. They are not normal. Probate is avoidable. Let me tell you about a legal wonder drug which will give you permanent immunity from the probate racket. It's called the intervivos or living trust. Intervivos, that's I-N-T-E-R-V-I-V-O-S. Intervivos. Some people say intervivos. It simply means in your lifetime. It's a trust which you set up during your lifetime. Many people are familiar with a testamentary trust. A man may direct in his will, for example, that his estate is to be turned over to the XYZ Trust Company, which is to pay the income to his widow during her lifetime, and then distribute the principal among his children. That's called a testamentary trust, because it comes into being through the instrumentality of your last will and testament. The only trouble is that it does not begin to function as a trust until your will has cleared probate. And on average, this takes two to five years. The inter vivos trust is outside the jurisdiction of the probate court. You bring it into being during your lifetime, and it simply continues after your death. You may say, for example, I declare that I am holding this house in trust for my wife Mary. I direct that upon my death, my successor trustee is to turn the property over to the beneficiary and terminate the trust. I appoint as successor trustee hereunder the beneficiary. You file a copy of this declaration of trust with the town clerk's office or the registry of deeds or such other place in your community where real estate transfers are customarily recorded. You also file a quit claim deed by which you, as the owner of the property, turn it over to yourself as trustee under the declaration of trust I've just mentioned. Now, under this arrangement, when you die, your wife has only to file a death certificate to establish her authority to act as successor trustee. 
In that capacity, she simply turns the house over to herself as beneficiary. It's all quite simple. No lawyers, executors, appraisers, or probate court fees. No two to five years delay. No piece in the paper telling all your business. Or perhaps you have a savings or checking account. You may execute a declaration of trust in which you say, I declare that I am holding this account in the XYZ Bank in trust for my husband George, and if he does not survive me, for my niece Betty Smith. I direct that upon my death, my successor trustee is to turn the account over to the beneficiary and thereby terminate the trust. I appoint as successor trustee hereunder whosoever shall at that time be beneficiary. Just file the declaration of trust with the bank, which will probably list your name on the bank book as Mary Jones, trustee under her Declaration of Trust dated January 10th, 1967. If you die, your husband George has only to present a copy of your death certificate to the bank to establish his authority over the account. As successor trustee, he simply turns the account over to himself. That's all. No probating. If he predeceases you, or if you and he die in a common accident, your niece becomes the successor trustee and turns the account over to herself, just as you directed. Perhaps you own some mutual fund shares. You're unmarried and you want them to go at your death to your three sisters. Just execute a declaration of trust saying, I declare that I am holding these shares of XYZ Mutual Fund in trust for my three sisters. Then you say, upon my trustee to turn the shares over to the beneficiaries and terminate the trust. I hereby appoint as successor trustee hereunder the beneficiary named first above. Whoever you listed first will have the responsibility for filing your death certificate with the mutual fund, taking over as successor trustee, and dividing up the shares among the three beneficiaries you have named. Again, no expense, no delay, no publicity. In a word, no probate. Or perhaps you just own some shares of stock which you'd like to have go to your wife if she survives you, otherwise to your children in equal shares. Simply execute a declaration of trust saying, I declare that I am holding these shares of XYZ Common in trust for my wife Mary, hereinafter called the first beneficiary, or if she does not survive me, for my children in equal shares. I direct my successor trustee upon my death to turn the property over to the beneficiary and terminate this trust. I hereby appoint as successor trustee hereunder the first beneficiary, or, if she be not surviving, my brother George Smith. Now, under this arrangement, if your wife survives you, she takes over as successor trustee and turns the shares over to herself as beneficiary. If she doesn't survive you, you've given your brother George the job of taking over and holding the property in trust for your minor children until they're 21. Again, no probate. Any property which can be passed under a will can be passed easier and cheaper under an intervivos trust. A brokerage account? A safe deposit box? U.S. savings bonds? a closed corporation, a small unincorporated business, personal effects, a diamond ring, or a mink coat, or perhaps that antique sofa which you inherited from your Aunt Sophie. Any and all of these things can be passed to someone at your death without having been touched by the sticky fingers in the probate court. Many persons seek to avoid probate by placing their assets in joint ownership with their spouse or with some other person. Such joint ownership frequently creates many more problems than it solves. For example, many persons do not realize that when they place property in joint tenancy, they are making the other person a gift of one half of its value. Thus, if a man purchases $20,000 worth of securities, and registers them jointly in his name and his wife's, he is making her a gift of one half of their value, or $10,000. You may give any number of persons $3,000 each in any one calendar year without becoming liable for payment of a gift tax. 
In the instance I have just cited, the man who made his wife a gift of $10,000 benefited from a special 50% exemption which applies to a gift made to your spouse, which reduced his net gift to her to only $5,000. In addition to the annual exclusion of $3,000, each of us has a lifetime exemption of $30,000, which may be applied to any gifts we make. His $5,000 net gift to his wife ran $2,000 over the annual exclusion, and he could charge the overage off against the $30,000 lifetime exemption. But he is required by law to file a gift tax return. Uncle Sam wants to know when we've used up our lifetime exemption, and our friend would have been subjected to a penalty if he didn't file the proper return. Joint ownership invariably increases estate tax liability. If a husband dies, the Internal Revenue Service insists that the property actually all belong to him. Unless the wife can produce documentary proof that she actually supplied half of the money to buy the property, it will all be taxed as a part of the husband's estate. On the other hand, if the wife dies first, Uncle Sam will consider the joint ownership as prima facie evidence that half of the property should be taxed as a part of her estate. So, you see, you end up with a 150% tax liability. It's all taxed if the husband dies, and it's half taxed if the wife dies. If a husband wishes to put property in his wife's name, he should simply make her an outright gift and let it be in her name alone. If, when he bought the $20,000 worth of stock, he registered half in his name and half in his wife's name, the only thing which Uncle Sam could talk about for tax purposes, should one of them die, would be the shares in that person's name. Joint ownership is never a substitute for a will or for a trust. I know of a widower with two small children who remarried a fine woman who was a wonderful mother to his children. Knowing that she would take good care of them after he was gone, he placed all of his real estate and securities in joint tenancy with her. While they were on vacation, their car rolled off a ferry and both were drowned. The law says that when husband and wife die in a common accident, the husband died first. In this instance, all of his jointly owned property became a part of her estate. Unfortunately, she hadn't made a will. Equally, unfortunately, she wasn't related to his children. She was simply their stepmother. Every penny of his estate went to a distant cousin of hers whom she heartily detested and hadn't spoken to for 20 years, and not a penny went to his two children. Yes, joint ownership creates many more problems than it solves. As a professional estate planner, I recommend against joint ownership of anything except the family domicile, which may be held by the husband and wife jointly. Incidentally, this is the only item of property which Uncle Sam will allow you to place in joint names without having to file a gift tax return, and you must hold it jointly with your spouse, not with any other person. A husband and wife holding their real estate in joint ownership may together execute an inter vivos declaration of trust in which they name their children or any other persons to receive the real estate upon the death of the surviving joint owner. This is much better than simply holding the property under the common form of survivorship deed. If you and your wife holding real estate jointly die in a common accident, your property will slip into the clutches of the probate court. If together you have executed an inter vivos trust and you die in a common accident, the property will promptly revert to your children or such other beneficiaries as you have named without going through probate. I've been a professional estate planner for 36 years. Many years ago, I became aware of the abuses of probate and of the advantages of the inter vivos trust as a device for avoiding the delay expense, and publicity of probate. I began quietly telling people about it. But then one day, the Bar Association in my state of Connecticut 
went into court and obtained an injunction requiring me to stop telling people how to avoid probate. I felt then, and still do, that this was an abridgment of my constitutional right of free speech. It was also an abridgment of your right to know. I felt that if I couldn't tell people, I could at least write a book which would explain to them how they could avoid probate. That's how I came to write the book, How to Avoid Probate. Lawyers in all parts of the country have been denouncing the book. The American Bar Association issues periodic thundering denunciations of it. Their private opinion of it is quite different, however. I have obtained a copy of a confidential report prepared by the American Bar Association and circulated privately to attorneys in which it acknowledges that my charges of corruption are quite true. The abuses which I have here detailed for you do in fact exist, the association admits. As for my solution, the use of the inter vivos trust, the report states that, quote, the American Bar Association is committed to a quite identical solution, unquote. What they cannot forgive me for is my suggestion to you that you are qualified to administer your own estate. It's my contention that you can accomplish these desirable ends without paying a lawyer a cent, which they find so unpalatable. Lawyers think that we're pretty dumb, and I, I suppose that we are. The way we've let them lead us around by the nose. As the Denver Post remarked on this point, one of them told us the other day that the average man was too dumb to make out his own application for a driver's license. They don't want to change the system, the law resists change. The Yale Law School's distinguished Fred Rodell, in his remarkable book, Woe Unto You, Lawyers, wrote, In tribal times, there were the medicine men. In the Middle Ages, there were the priests. Today, there are the lawyers. For every age, a group of bright boys, learned in their trade and jealous of their learning, who blend technical competence with plain and fancy hocus-pocus to make themselves masters of their fellow men. For every age, a pseudo-intellectual autocracy guarding the tricks of its trade from the uninitiated and running after its own pattern the civilization of its day. It is the lawyers who run our civilization for us, our governments, our business, our private lives. We cannot die and leave our property to our children without calling on the lawyers to guide us through a maze of confusing gestures and formalities that lawyers have created. Why should not a man who wants to leave his property to his wife at his death say in his will, I want everything I own to go to my wife when I die, instead of having to hire a lawyer and go through a long rigmarole of legal language? It is through the medium of their weird and wordy mental gymnastics that the lawyers lay down the rules under which we live. And it is only because the average man cannot play their game and so cannot see for himself how intrinsically empty of meaning their playthings are that the lawyers continue to get away with it. The legal trade, in short, is nothing but a high-class racket. The lawyers, or at least 99 and 44 one hundredths percent of them, are not even aware that they are indulging in a racket and would be shocked at the very mention of the idea. Once bitten by the legal bug, they lose all sense of perspective about what they're doing and how they're doing it. Like the medicine men of tribal times and the priests of the Middle Ages, they actually believe in their own nonsense. This fact, of course, makes their racket all the more insidious. Consecrated fanatics are always more dangerous than conscious villains, and lawyers are fanatics indeed about the sacredness of the word magic they call the law. Yet the saddest and most insidious fact about the whole legal racket is that the general public doesn't realize it's a racket either. Scared, befuddled, impressed and ignorant, they take what is fed them, or rather what is sold them. If only the average man could be led to see and know the cold truth about the lawyers and their law. If people could be made to realize how much of the vaunted majesty of the law is a hoax and how many of the mighty processes of the law are merely logical ledger domain, they would not long let lawyers lead them around by the nose. 
and people have recently begun, bit by bit, to catch on. The great illusion of the law has been leaking a little at the edges. If the ordinary man could see in black and white how silly and irrelevant and unnecessary it all is, he might be persuaded in a peaceful way to take the control of his civilization out of the hands of these modern purveyors of streamlined voodoo and chromium-plated theology, the lawyers. The law, inexorably devoted to all its most ancient principles and precedents, makes a vice of innovation and a virtue of hoariness. Only the law resists and resents the notion that it should ever change its antiquated ways to meet the challenge of a changing world. The law not only stands still, but is proud and determined to stand still. If a British barrister of 200 years ago were suddenly to come alive in an American courtroom, he would feel intellectually at home. The clothes would astonish him. The electric lights would astonish him. The architecture would astonish him. But as soon as the lawyer started talking legal talk, he would know that he was among friends. And given a couple of days with the law books, he could take the place of any lawyer present, or of the judge, and perform the whole legal mumbo-jumbo as well as they. Imagine, by contrast, a British surgeon of 200 years ago plopped down into a modern hospital operating room. He would literally understand less of what was going on than would any passerby brought in from the street at random. The law, alone of all the sciences, just sits aloof and practically motionless. Thus spoke Professor Rodell of Yale University. The legal instruments needed for the establishment of these inter vivos trusts I've been telling you about may be drawn for you by a local attorney. Unfortunately, many attorneys don't know about the inter vivos trust and how it works. To fill this need, the American Bar Association has just brought out a special training film narrated by the dean of the Harvard Law School which is intended for showing to local bar associations to educate the members on the advantages and the mechanics of the inter vivos trust. All too often, we've found, attorneys who do know about the living trust won't tell their clients about it. You see, it avoids probate. And most attorneys who've been practicing for a while begin to draw a substantial proportion of their income from seeing the estates of deceased clients through probate, so they're not about to tell you how to avoid it. As one prominent attorney was quoted in the New York Times, legal fees for drawing wills are small. The real money is in handling the estate after the death of the principal. The figures which we've discussed earlier disclosing the costs of handling estates certainly bear this out. Here on my desk is a letter from a man in California telling me that he has been to three different attorneys in that state, and they've all refused to draw an inter vivos trust for him. I've had countless letters from people reporting that local attorneys had advised them that the inter vivos trust was not legal in their state. This is a shockingly unethical practice for which the bar deserves nothing but scorn. The inter vivos trust is legal in every state of the Union. If you run into difficulty, I suggest that you obtain a copy of the book How to Avoid Probate, which not only gives detailed explanations and instructions, but also contains a wide variety of forms which may be detached from the book for actual use. These and many additional forms are made available to the public at quite modest cost by the National Estate Planning Council at 49 Plaza, Bridgeport, Connecticut, 06603. Won't you review thoughtfully the many points I've covered here and take immediate steps to see to it that your family never has to pay ransom to get your estate out of the local probate court? We all tend to procrastinate when it comes to doing the things which need to be done about our estates. My final advice to you is don't wait. Do it now.